Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. Because it, this text is uttered in the words of Jesus when they have brought news to Jesus that John the Baptist has been beheaded. And it is in this news that the Baptist has been, that Herod has beheaded the Baptist that Jesus utters these words. Now, you know, there are certain verses in Scripture that have been misappropriated over and over again, and this is one of them. I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody use this text, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force, as an example of that the church needs to go forth boldly. That's not what's going on here. What Jesus is doing is warning us that if you stay faithful to the kingdom of God and you dare speak words of God in this present age, you're going to suffer for it. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence when politicians are called to account for immorality and injustice. Go back to Mark chapter 6 and the story of the beheading of John. The reason Herod beheaded John was because Herod had committed incest. Herod was a notoriously violent and immoral man. Well, the problem is, is that when you call politicians to account for injustice and immorality, they normally lock you up and put you in jail. That's what happened to John the Baptist. Herod did not appreciate what he had to say, so Herod had him locked up. In 1945, the Nazis executed by hanging a German Lutheran pastor by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. What was Bonhoeffer's crime? He resisted Adolf Hitler. In 1980, a Catholic priest in El Salvador was celebrating Mass in his church. He had preached a sermon about the injustice of the El Salvadorian government. And as he completed his sermon, El Salvadorian soldiers broke into the church, fired their rifles, and executed Archbishop Romero at his altar. Politicians and powerful men don't like it when the Word of God calls them into accountability for their injustice. And we need to understand that. When we look at what's going on in our country right now, we have to understand that there is indeed injustice. There is racial injustice. There is in infant injustice in the form of abortion. There are all kinds of injustice. And the fact is that the politicians want us in their camp as long as we will keep our mouth shut and not speak about their injustices. Politicians want us in their corner, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, as long as we can deliver a vote and we will keep our mouth shut. There's a story in 1 Kings chapter 22. Ahab and Jehoshaphat have developed a military alliance. They're being threatened by the armies of Ramoth Gilead. Ahab is an evil king. Jehoshaphat's a righteous king. It's amazing how sometimes we'll sit down and have dinner with the devil if it'll promote our cause. Jehoshaphat knew he needed Ahab's help, but Jehoshaphat wanted to hear from a prophet of the Lord. Jehoshaphat asked Ahab, do you have any prophets here that we might inquire of God? And Ahab said, I've got a whole lot of prophets here. Let's hear from them. And Ahab marched them all in. And they all said, go right ahead. God is with you. You will have success. And Jehoshaphat looked at Ahab and he said, do we have any real prophets here? Do we have a prophet here that speaks the word of Yahweh? And Ahab said, well, there's one, but he never says anything good about me. His name is Micaiah. Jehoshaphat said, bring him in. They brought him in and Ahab looked at him and said, whatever you do, you better speak good of me. So the first thing out of Micaiah's mouth, a little sarcastically was, Go ahead, do what you're going to do. God will give you success. But then Jehoshaphat said, uh-uh, tell us the truth. And then Micaiah looked at him and said, you go out together and God will scatter your armies. And that's exactly what happened. What we need is for Christians to show up in Democrat politics and Republican politics and Libertarian politics. But what we need is for us to rem be reminded that we don't speak for Republicans and we don't speak for Democrats. We speak for Jesus Christ. We're not called to be good Republicans. We're not called to be good Democrats. We're not even called to be good Americans. We're called to be good Christians. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence 
when God's people make political alliances with ungodly powers. Too often in the history of the church, the message of Jesus has been co-opted by the priorities and agenda of this corrupted age. When Adolf Hitler was ascending to power in the 1920s and 30s in, in, in Germany, what a lot of us don't remember is that he had the support of the church in Germany. In the 1850s and 60s when our country was headed towards civil war, the church was split right down the middle. Right down the middle. Southern Baptists and Southern Presbyterians, and by the way, that's why there's a Southern Baptist church and a Northern Baptist church, is because they split over the issue of slavery. Reading the same Bibles, somehow forgetting the words of Jesus, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim deliverance to the captives. How in the name of God can you defend slavery when you read those words of Jesus? But Southern Christians did. Southern Baptists and Southern Methodists and Southern Presbyterians did. James warned us in James chapter 4 verse 4. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We normally interpret this about going to fairs and football games, going to see movies. That's not what James is saying. Being a friend of the world means making an alliance with a political power that is contrary to the message of Jesus Christ. This is what we've got to do. We've got to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We've got to be ambassadors to Democrats and Republicans. We've got to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ to white folks and black folks and brown folks. We've got to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ to English speakers and, and, and Spanish speakers and, and Arabic speakers everywhere we go. We've got to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. That means that we're going to be ministers of reconciliation. That means we're going to demonstrate love. That means we're going to make friends quickly with our opponents. That means we're going to be peacemakers because blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons and daughters of God. We don't compromise the message of the gospel for the sake of political expediency. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence when the gospel conflicts with the religious and economic interest of the culture. Don't you ever forget what I'm about to tell you. Politics is a secular religion. In Acts chapter 19, Paul has gone to Ephesus and he has preached the gospel and people are getting saved and people are getting baptized in the spirit and demons are being cast out. There's a problem. It's all happening in the shadow of the great temple of Artemis. It controlled the religious and economic interest of the entire that part of the world in Asia Minor. Acts chapter 19 verse 23, about that time there occurred no small disturbance. In other words, there occurred a riot concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing a lot of business to the craftsmen. He gathered them together and said, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. There's a reason that political parties embrace certain movements, it's because of money. Let me tell you something, as long as we make choices about money, injustice will always prevail. As long as money guides our ethics, that means we bow at the altar of mammon. The gospel of Jesus Christ must be proclaimed. And when we proclaim it and it challenges a slave interest or an abortion interest or a gay interest, then they come against us with violence. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence when Christians refuse to bow before the power. The temptation of Jesus. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, go Satan, for it is written you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You don't bow before the powers. Jesus refused to bow before Satan. And by doing so gives us an example that we're not to bow before the powers of this world, but we're to resist them. We're to wrestle against the powers of darkness. James chapter 4 verse 7. 
After in 4.4 4, he said that friendship with the world is hostility with God. In verse 7 he said, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Don't ever forget that the cross signifies the conflict between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of heaven. It is the crucified Jesus that holds the key to the future. It is the resurrected Jesus, the ascended Jesus, who sits at the right hand of the Father. The cross signifies God's victory over the powers of this world. In Colossians chapter 2, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. Which, were, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross when he disarmed the rulers and authorities. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them. The cross is the only way we triumph 